Your Majesties, Your Royal Highness, Nobel Peace Prize Laureate, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, Dear Aung San Suu Kyi, we have been waiting for you for a very long time. However, we are well aware that your wait has been infinitely trying for you and of an entirely different nature than ours. But please know this. In your isolation, you have become a moral voice for the whole world. Today's event is one of the most re remarkable in the entire history of the Nobel Prizes. In 1991, you were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and now I'm quoting the committee at the time, for one of the most extraordinary ex examples of civil courage in Asia in recent decades. In the committee's opinion, the prize would support the many people throughout the world who are striving to attain democracy, human rights, and ethnic conciliation by peaceful means. The 21-year interim has proved the committee right about this. But it is you, Aung San Suu Kyi, who translated the committee's words into reality through your awe-inspiring tenacity, sacrifice, and firmness of principle. Your voice became increasingly clear the more the military regime tried to isolate you. Your cause mobilized your people and prevailed over a massive military junta. And whenever your name is mentioned or when you speak today, your words bring energy and hope to the entire world. You are a precious gift to the world community. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we have seen it so many times before. Weapons and uniforms without any moral grounding in universal human rights are doomed to fail sooner or later. Fortunately, in today's world, human rights do not recognize national frontiers. Oppressive rulers must know that there will always be courageous individuals who will oppose them, and the world keeps an eye on the oppressors. Suu Kyi could not attend the prize award ceremony in, on the 20th, 10th of December 1991. Granted, she could probably have left her country, but she was afraid that the military regime would be so pleased to see her gone that they would refuse to let her back in again. All the prize laureates who have been unable to come to Oslo to accept their medals have also earned a place in the annals of history. Karl von Ossieski for his battle against Hitler's Germany, Andrei Sakharov and Lech Walesa for the fight against Soviet communism, and Liu Xiaobo for his struggle to promote human rights in China. Now Aung San Suu Kyi is finally here. We hope that Liu Xiaobo will not have to wait as long as she has had to before he can come to Oslo. <clears throat> Aung San Suu Kyi is a daughter of the great Aung San, leader of Burma's struggle for liberation. He was murdered before completing his fight for freedom. His daughter was just two years old at the time. Her mother was later appointed Burma's ambassador to India. 
The daughter got a world-class education in her native country, but also in India, at Oxford, in Kyoto, and New York. In 1972, she married Michael Aris, a professor and an authority on Tibetan Buddhism. They have two children, Alexander and Kim. Initially, Su Shi did not show much interest in Burmese politics, but she became more and more interested in Burmese history. Her father's fight for freedom, Buddhism, and Gandhi's policy of non-violence. Her many letters to her husband made it increasingly clear, I only ask one, she wrote, one thing, she wrote, that should my people need me, you would help me to do my duty by them. She could also fall into the clutches of fear. Sometimes I am beset by fears that circumstances and national considerations might tear us apart just when we are so happy in each other, the separation would be a torment. In March 1988, after 20 years abroad, Su Chi was informed that her mother had suffered a stroke. The next day, she left for Rangoon to care for her ailing mother. At the time, the military regime that had run Burma since 1962 was in the throes of crisis. The old di dictator, Nevin, had to formally step aside. Demonstrations broke out. Many lost their lives when the military forces fired into the crowds. It was not long before Su Chi was involved in what became known as Burma's second fight for freedom. As Aung San's daughter, and, in, and with the indisputable ability as a speaker, she soon emerged as a leader of the opposition. In her first major speech, she addressed herself to the reverend monks and people and said, this public rally is aimed at informing the whole world of the will of the people, of a purpose is to, is to show that the entire people entertain the keenest desire for a multi-party democracy democratic system of government. Although her mother passed away, Su Chi remained in Burma. The military grew to fear the rapid rise in her popularity and placed her in restricted residence. They had promised to, help, to hold free elections, and they probably overestimated the chances of winning. But to be on the safe side, though, they initiated a large-scale campaign against Su Xi. She was accused of being too foreign and knowing too little about Burma after 20 years, 28 years abroad. But she responded, they claim that I know too little about Burmese politics. The trouble is that I know too much. Su Xi's party, the National League for Democracy, won 392 of the 485 seats in the National Assembly. Nonetheless, the military ignored the result. Aung San Suu Kyi remained under house arrest. Like so many times before, the Norwegian Nobel Committee reacted. We all remember the ceremony in 1991. The Nobel Committee had arranged for two Burmese musicians to fly in from Los Angeles to play Su Xi's favorite piece. That same piece will be played here again today. The high point of that ceremony was a speech that her son Alexander delivered on behalf of his mother. He emphasized the prize what not, was not primarily an award for his mother but for the many who fought for democracy in Burma under very difficult circumstances. He expressed the hope that even within the military forces, there might be people who wanted victory for democracy. I know, he said, that within the military, there are those to whom the present policies of fear and repression are abhorrent 
violating the most sacred principles of Buddhist heritage. It was a conviction my mother reached in the course of her dealings with those in positions of authority. And we Norwegians still remember Alexander's words well when he said, the Burmese can today hold their heads a little higher in the knowledge that in this far distant land, their suffering has been heard and heeded. We never forgot Aung San Suu Kyi. When we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2001, with more than 30 Peace Prize laureates attending, we left one square empty, and the appeals for your freedom were many. So dear Aung San Suu Kyi, you have always ha held a place in our hearts. And we have asked ourselves all along, where do you draw your strengths from? Isolated from the outside world. In the beginning, your family was allowed to visit you. This was because the authorities thought your family would manage to convince you to leave the country. When that failed, they were no longer allowed to visit you. Even when your husband's life was ebbing away due to cancer, he was not allowed in. When the authorities opened a package from your family and used the contents against you, and the content was a lipstick and an exercise video, you re refused to accept supplies from the outside world. You sold furniture to buy food. Deficiencies, deficiency diseases became a problem. You must have had infinite faith in your cause in over common course. Like Nelson Mandela, you could reach out to your prison guards. Like Liu Xiaobo, you could say, I have no enemies. In your own words recently, I have tremendous goodwill towards the military, so it doesn't bother me to sit with them. We know that you have become a true humanitarian through Buddhism and meditation. The idea of love, tenderness, metta, carries your message. You said not only should one speak only the truth, one's speech should lead to harmony. It should be kind and pleasant and it should be beneficial. No bitterness, no animosity. Only a true champion for mankind can behave like this. We must also remind one another of what fear is when we are here today. And that is counterpart, and the counterpart is hope. In your essay, Freedom from Fear, you write, Within a system which denies the existence of basic human rights, fear tends to be the order of the day. Fear of imprisonment, fear of torture, fear of death, fear of losing friends, family, property or means of livelihood, fear of poverty, fear of failure. But rulers also feel fear. They are not as powerful as they might appear to be. They get up every morning afraid of the people because deep down they know that there are things greater than fear, for example, hope and courage. This is the reason why, we can, why every, every dictatorship has been teared down. Their fear of the fearlessness of the people is so great that control of the people is preventing the innovation and dynamic needed in every society. And the lack of control over the elite leads to corruption and the abuse of power. So the combination of control of the people and the lack of control of the elite leads to misrule and stagnation and ultimately very often revolutions. So consequently, the democracies of the world should not despair 
today when they see authoritarian regimes outpacing their economic growth. This is temporary. The regimes will be broken apart by inner contradictions if they do not reform themselves. The democracies will always find new paths. The democracies have come out winners in history because the people can elect new leaders when the old one fail. And democracies are peacemakers. Democracy, democracy creates fraternity across national frontiers and within nation states. This was probably what Alfred Nobel understood. And for that reason, he wrote in his last will that the Nobel Peace Prize should be awarded to the one, and I quote, who shall have done the most or the best work for fraternity between nations. That was one of the three criteria for the Nobel Peace Prize. Few people meet this criterion better than you, Aung San Suu Kyi. A true fraternity among all ethnic groups in Burma and the neighboring countries starts with free elections, free people. Few believed that the dissolution of the military junta and the appointment of Tain Sen as president just over a year ago would have brought such major changes. But something happened. Aung San Suu Kyi was released. Political prisoners were released from prisons. The media could operate more independently. Ceasefires were signed when, uh, with the ethnic minorities. The huge dam project with China was suspended, sending a clear signal of change to the surrounding world. But the struggle is not over. It created quite a sensation when you answered the question of where you would place the democratic development of Burma on a scale from 1 to 10, and you said, we are approaching 1. The question could hardly have been answered more clearly. Dear Aung San Suu Kyi, you carry a heavy burden on your shoulders. No one can be certain of what the future will bring. But today you are here, and we know for sure that you can return home. I will conclude by reiterating the words of the chair of the Nobel Committee in 1991, Francis Seierstedt, an outstanding Norwegian and an intellectual giant. He expressed the hope that your struggle would be crowned with victory. He concluded by urging people to show humility and show fearlessness. Like Aung San Suu Kyi, the result will be a better world to live in, he said. <clears throat> Few have done more than you have to make the world a better place for all of us. We thank you for your fearlessness, your tenacity, and your strength. You bring hope to the oppressed people across the world. Your life is a message to all of us, namely that universal human rights do not come from any authority and any law. They came from the fact that we are human, human beings, and we have to insist and fight for them. You have paid a high price, but you have been spreading hope, and the world needs hope. Dear Aung San Suu Kyi, thank you from the bottom of our hearts.
Your Majesties, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, now I have the pleasure to invite the Nobel Peace Prize laureate of 1991 to come forward to give us her lecture. We do not have a gold medal because it was received by your son Alexander in 1991, but I'm sure that your words to us today will be written in gold. Please. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, distinguished members of the Nobel Committee, dear friends. Long years ago, sometimes it seems many lives ago, I was at Oxford listening to the radio program Desert Island Disc with my young son, Alexander. It was a well-known program. For all I know, it still continues on which famous people from all walks of life were invited to talk about the eight discs, the one book beside the Bible and the complete works of Shakespeare, and the one luxury item they would wish to have with them were they to be marooned on a desert island. At the end of the program, which we had both enjoyed, Alexander asked me if I thought I might ever be invited to speak on desert island discs. Why not? I responded lightly. Since he knew that, in general, only celebrities took part in the program, he proceeded to ask me, with genuine interest, why I thought I might be invited. I considered this for a moment and then answered, perhaps because I'd have won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And we both laughed. The prospect seemed pleasant, but hardly probable. I cannot now remember why I gave that answer, perhaps because I had recently read a book by a Nobel laureate, or perhaps because the desert island celebrity of that day had been a famous writer. In 1989, when my late husband Michael Ayres came to see me during my first term of house arrest, he told me that a friend, John Finnis, had nominated me for the Nobel Peace Prize. This time, I also laughed. For an instant, Michael looked amazed. Then he realized why I was amused. The Nobel Peace Prize, a pleasant prospect, but quite improbable. So how did I feel when I was actually awarded the Nobel Prize for peace? The question has been put to me many times, and this is surely the most appropriate occasion on which to examine what the Nobel Prize means to me and what peace means to me. As I have said repeatedly in, so ma in many an interview, I heard the news that I had been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize on the radio one evening. It did not altogether come as a surprise because I had been mentioned as one of the front runners for the prize in a number of broadcasts during the previous week. While drafting this lecture, I've tried very hard to remember what my immediate reaction to the announcement of the award had been. I think I can no longer be sure. I think it was something like, oh, so this does, they've decided to give it to me. It did not seem quite real, because in a sense, I did not feel myself to be quite real at that time. 
Often, during my days of house arrest, it felt as though I were no longer a part of the real world. There was a house, which was my world. There was the world of others, who also were not free, but who were together in prison as a community. And there was the world of the free. Each one was a different planet, pursuing its own separate course in an indifferent universe. What the Nobel Peace Prize did was to draw me once again into the world of other human beings outside the isolated area in which I lived to restore a sense of reality to me. This did not happen instantly, of course, but as the days and months went by and news of reactions to the award came over the airwaves, I began to understand the significance of the Nobel Prize. It had made me real once again. It had drawn me back into the wider human community. And what is more important, the Nobel Prize had drawn the attention of the world to the struggle for democracy and human rights in Burma. We were not going to be forgotten. To be forgotten. The French say that the part to part is to die a little. To be forgotten, too, is to die a little. It is to lose some of the links that anchor us to the rest of humanity. When I met Burmese migrant workers and refugees during my recent visit to Thailand, many cried out, don't forget us. They meant, don't forget our plight. Don't forget to do what you can to help us. Don't forget, we also belong to your world. When the Nobel Committee awarded the Peace Prize to me, they were recognizing that the oppressed and the isolated in Burma were also part of the world. They were recognizing the oneness of humanity. So for me, receiving the Nobel Peace Prize means, personally, extending my concern for democracy and human rights beyond national borders. The Nobel Peace Prize opened up a door in my heart. The Burmese concept of peace can be explained as the happiness arising from the cessation of factors that militate against harmo the harmonious and the wholesome. The word nyenjang translates literally as the beneficial coolness that comes when a fire is extinguished. Fires of suffering and strife are raging around the world. In my own country, hostilities have not yet ceased in the far north. north. To the west, communal violence resulting in arson and murder were taking place just several days before I started out on the journey that has brought me here today. News of atrocities in other reaches of the earth abound. Reports of hunger, disease, displacement, joblessness, poverty, injustice, discrimination, prejudice, bigotry. These are our daily fare. Everywhere, there are negative forces eating away at the foundations of peace. Everywhere can be found thoughtless dissipation of material and human resources that are necessary for the conservation of harmony and happiness in our world. The First World War represented a terrifying waste of youth and potential, a cruel squandering of the positive forces of our planet. The poetry of that era has a special significance for me because I first read it at a time when I was the same age as many of those young men who had to face the prospect of withering before they had barely blossomed. A young American fighting with the French Foreign Legion wrote before he was killed in action in 1916 that he would meet his death at some disputed barricade, on some scarred slope of battered hill, or at midnight 
in some flaming town. Youth and love and life perishing forever in senseless attempts to capture nameless, unremembered places. And for what? Nearly a century on, we have yet to find a satisfactory answer. Are we not still guilty, if to a less violent degree, of recklessness, of improvidence, with regard to our future and our humanity? War is not the only arena where peace is done to death. Wherever suffering is ignored, there will be the seeds of conflict, for suffering degrades and embitters and enrages. A positive aspect of living in isolation was that I had ample time in which to ruminate over the meanings of words and precepts that I had known and accepted all my life. As a Buddhist, I had heard of dukkha, generally translated as suffering, since I was a small child. Almost on an, a daily basis, I heard elderly and sometimes not so elderly people around me murmuring, dukkha, dukkha, when they suffered from aches and pains or when they met with some small annoying mishaps. However, it is only during my years of house arrest that I got around to investigating the nature of the six great dukkha. These are to be conceived, to age, to sicken, to die, to be parted from those one loves, to be forced to live in propinquity with those one does not love. I examined each of the great sufferings, not in a religious context, but in the context of our ordinary, everyday lives. If suffering were an unavoidable part of our existence, we should try to alleviate it as far as possible in practical, earthly ways. I mulled over the effectiveness of antenatal and postnatal programs and mother and child care, of adequate facilities for the aging population, of comprehensive health services, of compassionate nursing and hospices. I was particularly intrigued by the last two kinds of suffering, to be parted from those one loves and to be forced to live, live in propinquity with those one does not love. What experience might our Lord Buddha have undertaken, undergone in his own life that he had included those two states among the great sufferings? I thought of prisoners of conscience and refugees, of migrant workers and victims of human trafficking, of that great mass of the uprooted of the earth who have been torn away from their homes, parted from families and friends, and forced to live out their lives among strangers who were not always welcoming. We are fortunate to be living in an age when social welfare and humanitarian assistance are recognized not only as desirable, but necessary. I am fortunate to be living in an age when the fate of prisoners of conscience anywhere has become the concern of peoples everywhere. An age when democracy and human rights are widely, if not universally, accepted as the birthright of all. How often during my years of ha under house arrest have I drawn strength from my favorite passages in the, universal, in the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind. And the advent of a world in which human beings shall enjoy freedom of speech and belief and freedom from fear and want has been proclaimed as the highest aspirations of the common people. It is essential if man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. If I am asked why I am fighting for human rights in Burma, the above passages will provide the answer. 
If I am asked why I'm fighting for democracy in Burma, it is because I believe that democratic institutions and practices are necessary for the guarantee of human rights. Over the past year, there has been signs that the endeavors of those who believe in democracy and human rights are beginning to bear fruit in Burma. There have been changes in a positive direction. Steps towards democratization have been taken. If I advocate cautious optimism, it is not because I do not have faith in the future, but because I do not want to encourage blind faith. Without faith in the future, without the conviction that democratic values and fundamental human rights are not only necessary, but possible for our society, our movement could not have been sustained throughout the destroying years. Some of our warriors fell at their post. Some deserted us. But a dedicated core remained strong and committed. At times, when I think of the years that have passed, I'm amazed that so many remain staunch under the most trying circumstances. Their faith in our cause is not blind. It is based on a clear-eyed assessment of their own powers of endurance and a profound respect for the aspirations of our people. It is because of recent changes in my country that I am with you today. And these changes have come about because of you and other lovers of freedom and justice who contributed towards a global awareness of our situation. Before continuing to speak of my country, may I speak out for our prisoners of conscience. There still remain such prisoners in Burma. It is to be feared that because the best known detainees have been released, the remainder, the unknown ones, will be forgotten. I'm standing here because I was once a prisoner of conscience. As you look at me and listen to me, please remember the often repeated truth that one prisoner of conscience is one too many. Those Those who have not yet been freed, those who have not yet been given access to the benefits of justice in my country, number much more than one. Please remember them and do whatever is possible to effect their earliest unconditional release. Burma is a country of many ethnic nationalities, and faith in its future can be founded only on a true spirit of union. Since we achieved independence in 1948, there never was it has been a time when we could claim the whole country was at peace. We have not been able to develop the trust and understanding necessary to remove causes of conflict. Hopes were raised by ceasefires that were maintain, maintained from the early 1990s until 2010, when these broke down over the course of a few months. One unconsidered move can be enough to remove long-standing ceasefires. In recent months, negotiations between the government and ethnic nationality forces have been making progress. We hope that ceasefire agreements will lead to political settlements founded on the aspirations of the peoples and the spirit of union. My party, the National League for Democracy, and I stand ready and willing to play any role in the process of national reconciliation. The reform measures that were put into motion by President Uthain Sein's government can be sustained only with the intelligent cooperation of all internal forces. 
the military, our ethnic nationalities, political parties, the media, civil society organizations, the business community, and most important of all, the general public. We can say that reform is effective only if the lives of our people are improved. And in this regard, the international community has a vital role to play. Development and humanitarian aid, bilateral agreements and investments should be coordinated and calibrated to ensure that these will promote social, political, and economic growth that is balanced and sustainable. The potential of our countries is enormous. This should be nurtured and developed to create not just a more prosperous, but also a more harmonious, democratic society where our people can live in peace, security, and freedom. The peace of our world is indivisible. As long as negative forces are getting the better of positive forces anywhere, we are all at risk. It may be questioned whether all negative forces could ever be removed. The simple answer is no. It is in human nature to contain both the positive and the negative. However, it is also within human capability to work to reinforce the positive and to minimize or neutralize the negative. Absolute peace in our world is an unattainable goal, but it is one towards which we must continue to journey, our eyes fixed on it as a traveler in a desert fixes his eyes on the one guiding star that will lead him to salvation. Even if we do not achieve perfect peace on earth, because perfect peace is not of this earth, common endeavors to gain peace will unite individuals and nations in trust and friendship and help us to make our human community safer and kinder. I use the word kinder after careful deliberation. I might say the careful deliberation of many years. Of the sweets of adversity, and let me say that they are not numerous, I have found the sweetest, the most precious of all, is the lesson I learned on the value of kindness. Every kindness I received, small or big, convinced me that there could never be enough of it in our world. To be kind is to respond with sensitivity and human warmth to the hopes and needs of others. Even the briefest touch of kindness can lighten a heavy heart. Kindness can change the lives of people. Norway has shown an exemplary kindness in providing a home for the displaced of this earth, offering sanctuary to those who have been cut loose from the moorings of security and freedom in their native lands. They are refugees from all parts of the world. When I was at the Mai La refugee camp in Thailand recently, I met dedicated people who were striving daily to make the lives of the inmates as free from hardship as possible. They spoke of their concerns over donor fatigue, which could also be translated as compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue, donor fatigue expresses itself precisely in the reduction of funding. Compassion fatigue expresses itself less obviously in the reduction of concern. One is the consequence of the other. Can we afford to indulge in compassion fatigue? Is the cost of meeting the needs of refugees greater than the cost that would be consequent on turning a, an indifferent, if not a blind eye, on their suffering? I appeal to donors the world over to fulfill the needs of these people who are in search, often it must seem to them in vain, of refuge. At Myla, I had valuable discussions with Thai officials responsible for the administration of Tak province, 
where this and many other camps are situated. They acquainted me with some of the more serious problems related to refugee camps. Violation of forestry laws, illegal drug use, home root spirits, the problems of controlling malaria, tuberculosis, dengue fever, and cholera. The concerns of the administration are as legitimate as the concerns of the refugees. Host countries also deserve consideration and practical help in coping with the difficulties related to their responsibilities. Ultimately, our aim should be to create a world free from the displaced, the homeless, and the hopeless, a world of which each and every corner is a true sanctuary where the inhabitants will have the freedom and the capacity to live in peace. Every thought, every word, and every action that adds to the positive and the wholesome is a contribution to peace. Each and every one of us is capable of making such a contribution. Let us join hands to try to create a peaceful world where we can sleep in security and wake in happiness. The Nobel Committee concluded its statement of 14th October 1991 with these words. In awarding the Nobel Peace Prize to Aung San Suu Kyi, the Norwegian Nobel Committee wishes to honor this woman for her unflagging efforts and to show its support for the many people throughout the world who are striving to, to attain democracy, human rights, and ethnic conciliation by peaceful means. The chairman beat me to it by repeating those words. When I joined the democracy movement in Burma, it never occurred to me that I might ever be the recipient of any prize or honor. The prize we were working for was a free, secure, and just society where our people might be able to realize their full potential. The honor lay in our endeavor. History had given us the opportunity to give of our best for a cause in which we believed. When the Nobel Committee chose to honor me, the road I had chosen of my own free will became a less lonely path to follow. For this, I thank the committee, the people of Norway, and peoples all over the world whose support has strengthened my faith, faith in the common quest for peace. Thank you.